This course is dedicated to individuals who want to use Hashcat in their career as penetration testers. But is this tool only made for penetration testers? Let's see together who can use Hashcat as a professional. So the first type of security professionals are, of course, penetration testers or red teams. They can use Hashcat to crack hashes after a penetration test discovery. For example, you were able to get a privilege escalation on a Linux host, and then with the root account, extract the hash credentials in the shadow file. Another example, let's say you found an SQL injection vulnerability, and you were able to extract the user's database hashed passwords. Now, assume you found a shared directory on the network, and the user saved an Excel sheet that contains confidential information, and it's protected with a password. Another practical example. In this one, you are able to exfiltrate the LDAP hashes. Then you can use Hashcat to test for weak passwords used by employees. Of course, these are not the only use cases for Hashcat. There are many of them. The goal here is to show you the importance of this tool in your career. Now comes the big question. Is this tool only for penetration testers? In fact, other security professionals can use it as well. People who work in application security test web applications before they're deployed into production. They can use Hashcat if they find an SQL injection vulnerability. Also, application security analysts can use Hashcat to test the encryption algorithm used for saving credentials in configuration files, for example. Folks, now you can see in practice the importance of this tool in the security field. Follow me to the next video lesson to see how the labs will look like in this course. Let's see together the lab host that I will be using for this course. It is a cracking rig that I built myself. And in the end of this course, I will show you how to build a similar one for yourself. This monster machine has six GPU cards, two disk drives, one for the operating system, and one for backing up the password dictionary files. Also, this host has a 32 gigabyte of memory size and a fast Intel with eight core CPU. The host operating system will be Ubuntu Linux. Finally, this host will be using Hashcat, and this is going to be the main tool in this course to show you how to crack hashes. Now, let me show you how to measure the speed of your cracking host. If you're using Kali Linux, you don't need to install Hashcat because it's already pre-installed for you. You just have to write your command and you're good to go. If you're using a Windows host, then to get Hashcat, you have to go to their website at hashcat.net. And if you scroll on the top of the page, you can click to download the compiled binaries. Now, if you want to have a dedicated Linux host, like Ubuntu, for example, you can install Hashcat using the terminal window command. sudo apt install hashcat tag y. In my case, Hashcat is already installed on this host. Now it's time to execute it. The first command that I want you to learn in this course is the benchmark. This specific command will allow you to measure the speed of cracking hashes. First, you start by the program name Hashcat, of course. The minus B stands for benchmark. And I will be measuring the speed of cracking the MD5 hash algorithm using the tag M0 option. 
After executing Hashcat, you can see the six GPUs that will be used for this calculation. At the bottom, Hashcat measured the cracking speed of each GPU device. And the total of all of them is around 165 giga hashes per second. That is crazy fast, folks. Now, what if I want to use both my CPU and my GPU combined together? In this case, I have to use the TAC capital D option and specify the CPU, which is number one, followed by the GPU, which is number two. On my host, I have to add the fourth option to use the CPU for this task. Look closely at how slow the CPU is compared to the GPU. That is why these days we don't use the CPU anymore for cracking hashes. In the rest of this course, I will be using the GPU only and exclude the CPU during the cracking process. Using Hashcat without understanding how crypto algorithm works is like driving to a destination without a plan. The word hash itself is inside the name of our tool Hashcat. Thus, it is important to understand this concept before starting to use Hashcat. In the upcoming video lessons, I will teach you the basics of hashing so you can use Hashcat like a pro. So what is hashing? The concept of hashing was established for data integrity. What does this mean in practice? For example, a user register in a website. And you, as an owner of this website, you don't want to save the password in clear text. So, in practice, developers use a hashing algorithm to ensure that no one can see the original value of the password. But guess what? We hackers can do that with Hashcat. That's what this course is all about. Now, let me show you an example of hash output of the text value GAS. Soon, we will dive deep into the output formats. Remember that when we say cracking a hash, then it means converting these hexadecimal numbers into the original clear text format, which is GAS in this case. Now, let's analyze a typical hash. Same as the previous example, using the algorithm SHA-256, we converted the word GAS into its hashed value. Computer scientists will use this notation lowercase h, which is equal to capital H of X. The lowercase h is the output in hexadecimal format, and it's called a digest or checksum. The capital H is the hashing algorithm used, and in our example, I used SHA-256 to get the job done. Finally, the X refers to the input data, and in this case, it's GAS. There are few requirements for hashing to work properly. First, hashing should be applied to any variable block of input data. In other words, the input can be anything and should not be limited. Second, the hash output must be of fixed length regardless of the input size. So, for SHA-256, the output length is always 256 bits and nothing else. Third, for practical purposes, the output should be easy to compute. Also, the output results should not be reversible to its original state. If you have the output or digest, you should not be able to calculate the input. But in this course, we will crack hashes and bypass this rule. Finally, 
two different input values should not have the same output. This is called a collision resistant. For example, Gus and John should not have the same digest output. Now let's see together where hashes can be used. Practically speaking, you can use hashing to generate a checksum for a file. By doing this, you can compare the generated checksum of the original file when you download it. The idea here, so you can compare it with the checksum that you generated after the download is complete. If they match, then no one has altered the file that you originally downloaded from the website. Thus, we ensure the integrity of this file. This concept is used also by antiviruses and intrusion detection systems to identify vulnerable files by using their file checksum value. Also, you can use hashing to store passwords in the database or a file. This technique will make sure not to store clear text passwords at rest. In fact, this scenario is one that we will use in this course to crack hashes. Why? Because we are interested in the password itself. There is a lot of hash algorithms that you will hear about in your career. In this section, I will list the most popular ones so you can crack them like a champion. The first one is MD5 and the digest output will look like this for the word gas. Take note that I will teach you more about each algorithm in the upcoming lessons. The second one, which is highly used these days, is SHA, and it has multiple versions and digest lenses. And TLM is the hash algorithm to store Windows operating system passwords. Again, I will talk more about it in the upcoming videos. Finally, the HMAC. In fact, this one is special because it uses a password on top of the hashing algorithm. Don't worry if it seems overwhelming for you. I will take the time to explain each one so you can use them in your career as a penetration tester with no hesitation. Message Digest version 5, aka MD5, is one of the common hashing algorithms. It replaced its predecessor MD4, which practically is not used anymore because it's not a secure algorithm at all. Word of caution, do not use MD5 to store passwords. I will talk later about more secure algorithms for storing passwords at rest. This doesn't mean that MD5 cannot be used at all. Many applications and websites still use MD5 to verify the integrity of files. For example, here's the digest output of the word gas using the MD5 algorithm. The output of MD5 is 128 bits or 32 hexadecimal characters. Since that, every hexadecimal character is equivalent to 4 bits, you do the math. And remember, whatever the input size is, the output size will always be 128 bits for MD5. All right, let's see a practical example. To easily generate a hash, you can use an online hash calculator like this one. Here, you can see all the hash values for the word gas including MD5. Now, I want to elevate the challenge a little bit and use Python to show you how MD5 works using a programming language. I will be using the PYCrypto library, 
which has all the hashing and encryption objects. Don't worry, you will see it in practice. First, I will execute the update command. This is a habit that I have before installing anything on my Kali system. Next, if I try to install the PY crypto library, it will tell me that I don't have pip installed. Pip is the installation package manager for Python. Anytime you want to install a new library, you must use it. Once it's installed, I can go ahead with the PY crypto library installation process. All right, now that we have everything in place, I will start by creating a new Python file and I'll call it md5example.py. First, I will import the crypto library by telling it that I want to use the MD5 function. Second, I will define the message variable that I want to hash, which is gas as usual. Then I will instantiate the MD5 hashing variable. After that, I'm using the update function to compute the hash value of the message variable. Finally, I'm printing the 128 bits hashed value in hexadecimal. I will save the file and run it using the Python 3 interpreter. And here you go. This is the digest value of the MD5 example for the word gas. I will be using the same concept in the upcoming sections. If you understood how this example works, then the others will be a piece of cake for you. Like MD5, the secure hash algorithm is another way to hash with a better security mechanism. Since the length of the output is longer than MD5, it will take more time for the cracker to calculate its hash. In other words, Hashcat will take longer to crack a modern SHA algorithm compared to MD5. Now, there are multiple versions of SHA. For example, SHA version 0 is the first one and it's not used anymore. SHA version 1, on the other hand, will generate an output of 160 bits compared to MD5, which generates 128 bits. Even SHA-1 is not considered to be secure these days. SHA version 2 came later to fix the weakness in SHA version 1, and it includes four output lenses. SHA-224, SHA-256, SHA-384, and SHA-512. The numbers at the end represent the output lens of the digest. For example, SHA-224 generates 224 bits of output. SHA version 3 was recently introduced by the NIST organization and it includes multiple sub-versions as well, 224, 256, 384, and 512 bits. SHA-3 is considered the most secure hashing algorithm these days. Now, let's see a practical example of the SHA hashing algorithm. First, I will create a file and call it SHA-example.py. At the beginning, I will import the library in order to use SHA-512 instead of MD5. Next, I will create the message variable that I want to hash. After that, I will instantiate the SHA-512 object. Then I will use the update function to calculate the hash output. And finally, print the results to the terminal window. I will save the file and run it using Python 3. 
and voila, this is a 512 bits digest output of the word gas. I invite you to change the message and replace the word gas with something that you like to experiment with the SHA algorithm. Hashed-based message authenticated code is another hashing algorithm, but the special one requires a secret key to use before applying the hash. What's nice about this algorithm is that it offers integrity and authenticity as well. In general, HMAC uses either MD5 or SHA-1 as a hashing algorithm. Hence, you have the notation HMAC MD5 and HMAC SHA-1. So, how does it work in practice? Let's say that Tyrell wants to send a message to Joanna. Tyrell will call Joanna on the phone and tell her the secret key and that the hashing algorithm will be HMAC MD5. So, from now on, when Tyrell wants to send a message to Joanna, he will use the same key and hashing algorithm. First, he will write his message and then compute its digest with HMAC MD5. And don't forget, he will use the secret key that he shared with Joanna on the phone. Now, when Joanna receives the message and the hash, then she will use the same secret key to compute Tyrell's original hash using HMAC MD5 algorithm. If the HMAC digest matches the initial HMAC generated by Tyrell, then we can say the message was not altered and authentic at the same time. The authenticity is because of the shared key between Joanna and Tyrell. An important concept in HMAC is that the message is not encrypted here. It stays in clear text. So the whole idea is to ensure the integrity and authenticity of the clear text message. Now, let's see how HMAC can be developed using my favorite programming language, Python. This time, it will be a little bit different than the previous examples. I will create a new Python file for this exercise. First, at the top, I will import the HMAC object. Then, I will define the secret key to use and make sure that the variable is a string type by using the str function. After that, I will create a variable to hold the message. This time, I will change gas to this is a message. Next, I will instantiate the HMAC object and pass the secret key and the message both as arguments to this constructor. And finally, print the results to the output window. We're done. I will save it and run it in the terminal window. Take a closer look. The output length is 128 bits because by default, the Python library picks the HMAC MD5 algorithm. Now it's your turn to practice this exercise on your Kali box. Old versions of the Windows operating system used to store passwords in LM hash format. LM hashes were easy to crack due to a lot of weaknesses. This hash type was used until the Windows Vista version and Windows Server 2008, but you can still enable it via the security policy settings. Nowadays, the Windows operating system uses NTLM version 2. And that is what we will be cracking in this course 
using Hashcat. What does it look like an NTLM hash saved on the Windows PC? Here's an example of it. The first part is the username, then the user ID. The semicolon is the separator between each section. After that, the constant AA, D3, etc. is always the same. It is there in case the user enabled LM hashes by mistake. Finally, the password value in NTLM hash. Take note that the hashes are stored in a SAM file under the config folder that resides in the system directory. Let's see how this file will look like in practice. As you can see, I have my PowerShell loaded in administrator mode under the config folder where the SAM file is saved by the operating system. Remember that the Windows OS will save all the NTLM hashed passwords in this file. If I try to open it using the type command, PowerShell will not be happy and will show an error that tells me this file is used by another process. Remember, we're hackers and we can bypass any security control, right? I mean, that's our goal during a pen test. Lucky us, there is a tool called pwdump and its main task is to accomplish this hack. Now it's time to run it. No options needed here, just run the executable and it should dump all the hashes. Look closely. The first item is the username, then the user ID, after that the constant, and finally the hashed password. Don't worry, in the future lessons you will see how to use Hashcat to crack those hashes, but for now you must understand how Microsoft Windows store its user credentials. Before I start explaining how a Linux operating system will store its user credentials, you will need to understand the salting concept first. When using a salt, we either prepend or append a random string to the original password before computing its digest value. For example, I have the password gas. Instead of generating a hash right away, which is susceptible to dictionary attacks, we will use a random salt string, which is ABC in this case. Then I choose to prepend the salt to the password and finally generate the hash digest output. Now, if we hackers have the value of the salt, then Hashcat will be able to crack it like a boss. If not, then we're in trouble. Lucky us, the salt value in Linux operating system is visible. So there is no problem cracking the hashed value using Hashcat. Now, how does it look like a user hashed password in a Linux system? Here's an example of the root user that you will see soon in the upcoming demo. Let's analyze each section by itself. The first part is the username. Take note that the colon character is used as a divider for each section. The second part, which is dollar sign six, and it identifies the hash algorithm used to store the hash. Linux uses the dollar sign one for MD5, dollar sign two A for Blowfish, dollar sign two Y for EKS Blowfish, dollar sign five for SHA256, and dollar sign six for SHA512, which is the case in our example above. Next is the salt value. Pay attention here that the dollar sign after the salt is used to separate 
the salt itself from the hashed value of the password. Ignore the rest because they are useless for hash cracking. The location of the hashed passwords in Linux are stored most of the time in the shadow file. And sometimes you will find them in the passwd file as well. Now let's see a practical example on an Ubuntu Linux OS. First, if I try to open the passwd file, I can see only the users but without their hashed passwords. My second guess is that they are saved in the shadow file. So let's open it. Here you go. This is the user Gus with its hashed password. And at the top of the file, Linux stored the root user hashed password value as well. Imagine the permissions that you will have if you're able to crack the root user on a Linux system. Now that you understand the basics of Linux user hashed passwords, in the future lessons, I will show you how to crack those hashes. Before ending this lesson, you need to understand an important concept about Linux passwords. I will open the shadow file and display the root account. Look closely at the hashed password. Is it really a digest of SHA-512? No, it is not. Instead, it's using another algorithm on top of it, and it's called Crypt3. The terminal window offers a tool called OpenSSL that will generate a hashed password for a Linux operating system. I will try to generate the same hashed output to the root account since I know the password for this user. I will use OpenSSL to get the job done. The first option will make sure to generate a hash compatible for users' credentials, which is Crypt3 algorithm. Next, I will specify that the hash algorithm is SHA-512 using the number 6. And finally, I will copy the salt value to use for this exercise. Once I press enter, the tool will ask me for the password that I want to hash. In order to generate the same hash as above, I need to supply the same password, right? And voila! If you look closely, the OpenSSL tool has generated exactly the same output calculated by the operating system when I initially created the password for this root account. In this lesson, I will show you in practice how to verify the file checksum after a download. For this example, I will download a Kali Linux ISO image from their website. On the right side, you can see that the owners of this website have created the original value of SHA-256 checksum. Now, once the file is downloaded on the host, I will open my terminal window and calculate its digest. And I will use the SHA-256 sum command, followed by the pass to the file name. Take note that once you press enter, the calculation will take some while to execute. So you have to be patient and not close the terminal window right away. Look closely. The terminal output value is the same as the one posted on the website, which means no one has altered the file. Hence, I verified the integrity of this file. For this exercise, I will be using Kali Linux to show you the basics of executing Hashcat. My main goal by using Kali OS and not my cracking rig, so you can follow up with me on your side before we start delving into more complicated scenario. 
All right, I will start the command by the application name. First, I will use the tag A followed by a zero. This option is instructing Hashcat that I will be using a dictionary attack mode. I will talk more about this type of attack later in this course. For the time being, try to understand what a basic Hashcat command will look like. Next, I will instruct Hashcat that I will be cracking an MD5 algorithm using the tag M0 option. After that, I will specify where I will be saving my hash that I need to crack. And finally, I'm telling Hashcat about the location of the dictionary file. The RockU text file contains a dump of possible passwords that have a high probability to match with our hash. Let's start the fun. First, I will create an empty file for storing our hash. Next, I will browse to the dictionary file pass specified in our comment. If you look closely at the file, you can see that it is already compressed. So, we need to decompress it using the gzip command and using the tag D option for decompressing the rockyou file. And voila, from now on, we can use this dictionary file for hash cracking. According to the internet, the first used password is 123456. Are you surprised? Try to search for yourself and you'll see with your own eyes. Let's hash this password using the Cyberchef website. All I have to do is to give it the clear text input and then drag the MD5 to the recipe section. Now that we have the hash digest output, I will copy it and store it in the file that we created earlier for this purpose. I will use the nano editor to get the job done. When I finish, I will press Ctrl O to save and then Ctrl X to exit. Let's go back to our original hashcat command and try to execute it. Look at that. Our hash has been cracked successfully. Now it's your turn to try it on your side. For this exercise, I will be cracking Windows hashed password for you to learn different types of hashes. I will be using the pwdump tool to dump these Windows host hashes. Please refer to the previous lessons where I showed you how to download this application. To run it, I will open PowerShell in administrator mode and browse to the directory where I installed pwdump. Once I'm in, I need to execute it. From this dump, I will choose the admin account to crack. So I will copy this line and switch to my Kraken rig. First, I will open the hashes text file and paste the dump value. Once I'm done, I will save and close. Next, I will need to know the ID for cracking NTLM hashes. For this purpose, I will use hashcat help command and then pipe out the results and search for the NTLM value. As you can see, the NTLM ID number is 1000. So now I can execute my hashcat comment. I will use the tag A0 for the dictionary attack. Next, I will use the NTLM hash type ID, which is 1000. 
and finally add the hashes file pass and not to forget the passwords dictionary file as well. Once I run it, I have an error. The token lens is not correct. Well, I did that on purpose to avoid you this kind of pitfalls when you use Hashcat in the future. If I visit the website of Hashcat, they have a dedicated page for hash types. When I search for NTLM, it shows what the input should look like. In this case, Hashcat is expecting the password's hash value only. So I will go back and open the hashes file and then remove the extra sections and leave only the hash value. Now let's try to rerun Hashcat. I will use the up arrow on my keyboard to go back to the previous comments and press enter to execute Hashcat. That was quick. The password for the admin account is the same as the username, admin. In this lecture, we will be cracking together a Linux password and my main goal is to teach you the different options in Hashcat. The first thing to show you is the help section in Hashcat. The output will show you all the possible options. Nevertheless, I prefer to read the help contents on the website of Hashcat. By clicking in the wiki section, then clicking on the Hashcat link to redirect me to the help page. Scroll down a little bit and you will visualize the different options you can use in this tool. Don't worry, in a few seconds I will show you an example. Also, don't forget that the help page will show the different hash type modes in case you want to use it as a reference. At the bottom, you have more options to tackle while using Hashcat. Now let's have some fun with a practical example. I will open the shadow file on this Kraken machine to pick a candidate for this demo. At the bottom of the file, we have a user called Elliot. Now let's see if we can crack his password. The big question is, how do I know which part to extract, right? If you remember from the previous lecture, there is a dedicated page on Hashcat website for this purpose. I will go back to the wiki page and scroll down, then click on the example hashes page link. Once I'm on the page, I will search for the Unix keyword using the browser search functionality. Here you go. Take note, the hash type ID is 1800. We will use it soon in our command. Now looking at the hash example, I can see which part I need to extract from the shadow file. I'll switch back to the terminal window and copy the hash value for hashcat. Next, I will open the hash file and get rid of the previously saved NTLM hash and paste the new Elliot hash password. All right, I will save and close the file and I'm ready to execute hashcat. Again, I will use the dictionary attack using the tag A0 option. For the hash type, it will be 1800 for Unix SHA-512 crypt algorithm. Next, I will use the tag capital O for an optimized kernel option. 
If you ever forget any option, always go back to the help page to remember the options that you want to use during the crack process. Now, after that, I will use the TAC W3, which refers to the workload profile. Since the default option uses number two, and in my case, I have a monster Kraken rig, so I can tune up the performance a little bit with no issues. Next, I will include a session name for this crack process. In fact, a session name will allow me to restore later if I decided to stop the cracking execution. Then I will use the tag lowercase o for saving the cracked value in a file. I'll open a new terminal tab and create the text file so Hashcat can save the results of the password after it's cracked successfully. One more option that is nice to have is the format for the output file. In this case, I've chosen to save the hash and the clear text password separated by a colon character. And of course, not to forget to specify the hashes file pass and the dictionary file as well. And press enter. The cracking process has finished. Let's check it out. Oh yes, the password has been cracked successfully. Now let's check the results. The password for Elliot is hacker. In this lecture, I will walk you through the different attack modes that you will encounter while using Hashcat. Take note that this is just a preparation ahead for the future lessons, where we will dive deep into each attack mode type. The first attack mode that you already saw is the straight attack, and which I call the dictionary attack. You can name it potato if you want, as long as you know what the purpose is of using it. Next is the combination attack. This type of attack will mix different word lists or dictionary files together. For the time being, just focus on the big picture. We will dive deep into this attack later in this course. After that comes the mask attack. This attack type will use different techniques to inject ASCII characters into a specified set of positions. The brute force attack is a subcategory of the mask attack. And I have a dedicated lecture to explain how it works in the future lessons. Next is the hybrid attack. And its main purpose is to join a word list with a mask attack or vice versa, where it will join a mask attack to a word list. Finally, there is a new type of attack mode, and it is called the association attack. This is fresh new in Hashcat, and it's not supported yet for production use. Check it out in the future when Hashcat will release it for production. Also, Take note that I won't be covering this attack mode in this course. Let's move to the next lesson where I will show you how to take advantage of the straight attack, or you can call it a dictionary attack, so you can use it with ease during your penetration test activities. At this stage, you know what a straight or dictionary attack is. What if you want to download larger and smarter dictionary files that allow you to crack more complex passwords? 
the web is your friend. The easy method is just to open your favorite search engine and search for download a dictionary file. The search results are endless and you can pick your favorite one. Now for downloading large word lists, you can use the WeekPass website. As you can see, they have compressed dictionary files with large sizes. Let's take the challenge to the next level. What if you want to create your own dictionary files by downloading multiple files from the internet and merging them together? Let's get it done. A very popular GitHub repository that has good amount of word lists is called sec lists. I will download it locally to my Linux host, but first I have to make sure to copy the URL. Then switch to my Kraken machine and execute the git clone command. Once the download is complete, I will browse to the passwords folder here we have a lot of password files. To avoid making any mistakes, I will copy all the text files to the temp directory. But before doing that, I will create a folder for this purpose. The copy is complete. Let's go and check the new folder. To get the job done, I will execute the cat command to merge all the text files together. At this stage, we have a single file, but with duplicates, most probably. To solve this problem, I will first sort the merged file and then use the unique command to remove the duplicates. And voila! Now we have a new dictionary file that we built ourselves from scratch. Now you know how to create your own dictionary file. Mixing a dictionary attack with a set of rules will open the gate for a penetration tester to crack more complex passwords. In fact, Rules are a set of functions that allow you to manipulate dictionary contents. For example, change a word to lowercase or uppercase. A rule can append or prepend a set of characters, invert a word or reverse it, duplicate it or insert characters at a certain position. Also, it can reject some words based on a condition. And much, much more. Probably you're asking yourself, do I need to create all this by myself? Of course not. Hashcat already has built-in rules files that come pre-packaged with a set of rules. Let's see it in action so you understand visually what I'm talking about. The rules folder is located where Hashcat was installed initially. In my case, it's slash user, slash share, slash Hashcat, and then the rules folder. If you're using Kali Linux, it should be the same pass location as well. Here, you can see we have a lot of choices of rules files to pick from. But which one to choose? Soon I will show you how, but for the time being, know where all these files are saved on the disk. Let's take a peek at one of the files in order to visualize the contents of a typical rule file. For example, the second line will use the R for reversing a word and then U to convert to uppercase. 
Below it, the rule is appending numbers and so on. You don't need to create your own rules file, but you need to understand its contents. That being said, let me show you how to use Hashcat help page for this purpose. If you go to this link URL on Hashcat website and scroll down a little bit, then you'll see all the possible functions that you can create with a rule file. In practice, we don't need to create a rule file, but which one is the best? There is an interesting article where they already tested multiple rules files against a set of passwords. If you scroll down a little bit, you will see a comparison table and you can see the winner on the top is a dive rule. But on the other hand, this rule file has so many functions and took so many candidates in order to crack those hashes. In other words, it took longer to finish the crack operation. The idea behind this article is to find a set of rules that has a high probability of wins with a shorter time. The creator of this article wrote a set of rules and named it one rule to rule them all. And check this out. This rule file has more cracking passwords capabilities with less time compared to the dive rule that comes with Hashcat. In order to download this rule file, we'll need to fetch it from their GitHub repository. Then copy it in order to clone it on our Linux host. And you can use the same steps on Kali Linux as well. Take note that I'm downloading the rule file under Hashcat rules directory. Then I will try to copy it. But it looks like I need my sudo permissions in order to make this happen. All right, problem solved. Now I have a copy of this file that I can use for my Hashcat. It's time for the fun part. I will be cracking a hash from A to Z so you can see things in practice. The hash that I want to crack is saved under the hashes text file. First, I need to identify the hash value. Is it SHA or MD5 or any other type of hash? To get the hash type, I will use an online hash identifier tool and paste the hash. It looks like our hash is SHA3224. Next, we need to find the ID of this hash type in Hashcat. I will use the help option combined with the grab command to filter out the results. Now that we know the number, we can start our Hashcat command. The tag A0 is for dictionary attack. Then tag M will specify the hash type, which is SHA-224. Tag W3 and tag O for high performance. And after that, I add the tag R for rules option. And I need to supply the path to the rules file that I want to use in order to crack this hash. And finally, run it. It's done. Now let's check out the results. Indeed, we were able to crack the password. Here's the most important question for this lesson. Do you think we're able to crack this password without a rules file and just a dictionary attack? Let's check it out. I will rerun the same comment and remove the tag R option to eliminate the rules option and press enter to execute it. Now it's the moment of truth. Unfortunately, 
Hashcat was unable to crack the password. The word exhausted here means that Hashcat used all the combinations and did not find a match. Creating your own custom word list is another skill that you need to learn while cracking hashes. The idea of this lesson is to show you how to extract words from a web server first. Then use the Hashcat rules file to make a custom word list. This type of dictionary file is sometimes effective during your engagements because employees tend to use passwords related to their companies. Also, you can use this type of word list in a CTF or your security certifications like the OSCP. Let's see it in action. I will use my blog website to show you how it works. In your case, it will be your client or your employer website. Next, if I go to the blog posts page and pick the one on the top, which it covers my book of Kali Linux. And if you're learning penetration testing, I highly encourage you to check it out. <laughs> Enough of my book. Now let's extract some words from this article using the cool command. I will use the tag M to tell the tool that I want to extract words with at least six characters and ignore anything less than that. And finally, I will extract all these words into the extract.txt file. Let's check how many words did we extract using this blog post. Check this out. We were able to extract 1,313 words. Amazing, right? Wait, I'm not done yet. Next, I will use a rule file using Hashcat to create my custom word list. Now, if I check the number of words created in this word list file, we have more than 100,000 words created from a simple blog post. A combinator attack combines two dictionary files instead of one. Isn't that amazing? Of course, combining two files together will take more time to crack a password, but we have a better posture than having just one file. Take note that the combinator attack is another type of attack and it's not just a dictionary attack anymore. The tag A1 will identify that this attack is being used, so we're not using the tag A0 for the combinator attack. Also, take note that at the end, we must specify the path to the two dictionary files that we want to use in our comment. I will show you an example soon in the demo. But for the time being, try to understand the layout of this attack type. So, how does it work? Imagine that we have two dictionary files. On the left, we have at the top of the file the word password and Jessica in the second line. On the right side, we have another dictionary file and it starts with the number 111, and after that, we have the exclamation mark. The combination of these two files will look like this, where it combines all the word possibilities together. On the other end, we can append characters to the dictionary files using rules, and the command will look like this, where Tag J is applied to the left dictionary file 
and the tag k is applied to the right dictionary file. If we use the same dictionary files that we just saw in the previous example, then the combined output will look like this, where the underscore is appended to the first dictionary file and the exclamation character is appended to the second dictionary file on the right. Now it's demo time. First, I will change the current directory to where I saved my password word lists. Here in this directory, I have two files that I will use for this attack demo. I will use the tag A1 for the combinator attack. For the hash, I will be cracking the same one that we used for the previous rules-based attack lesson. And of course, include the name of the two dictionary files that I want to use for this demo. And press enter to execute it. This attack will take longer to execute, and I will take the opportunity to explain what you can do while Hashcat is trying to crack a password. Here on this line, it gives you the option of pressing the S on your keyboard to see the status of the cracking process, or press P to pause it, or B to bypass the current cracking process and go to the next one. I've rarely used this one, but it's good to know it's here for use. The C for the checkpoint, which will quit Hashcat and create a checkpoint so you don't have to start from scratch when you re-execute it. And finally, the Q will just quit and stop the cracking process. For example, I will type S on my keyboard. Now, if you look closely, it shows me what is the current status of the cracking process. It's in the running phase at the moment. And I generally look for the estimated time to complete the hash cracking process as well. In this case, we have 13 hours left to finish processing all combination attack scenarios. Be careful, it doesn't mean that it will take that time to crack the password itself, but it will take around 13 hours before Hashcat is out of choices and exhausted. Check this out, Hashcat has finished and was able to crack the password after around a minute. A mask attack is not just any attack. By learning this type of attack will allow you to analyze passwords and how to crack them like the pros. That being said, how does this attack work? Let's say we have a password with four characters long but we don't know what to insert into each position, aka placeholder. In this case, we have the choice to insert different types of car sets, a lowercase character, for example, or uppercase character, a digit, maybe, or a special character. In the upcoming lessons, you will learn how to analyze and insert a proper mask. But for the time being, focus on the big picture. Another key element to understand is how to calculate the key space of your attack. The formula is simple. You calculate the number of car sets to the power of the password length. Let's take a practical example. Let's say you want to fill up the four positions above with only digits. So, how many combinations will have in this case? 10 digits, 
from 0 to 9, so it's 10 to the power of 4, where 4 is the length of the password itself. So we'll end up with 10,000 combinations. Go and get a cup of coffee because I'll need your full attention for the next couple of minutes. Are you ready? All right. First, let me show you the three types of car sets. The first one is called the built-in car sets. And in summary, we can just use one type of character. For example, a lowercase or uppercase letter, and so on. In the next slide, I will show you more details of this type. I added this slide specifically as a quick overview of the car set types that you will encounter when using Hashcat. The second type is the static car sets. As the name describes, we will be hard coding a specific ASCII character for this type. Next, and the most advanced one, is the custom car set. In this one, we can combine built-in and static car sets to accomplish more desirable results. Now, let's dig deep into the built-in car sets. The first type is the lowercase and it's designated by the question mark followed by the lowercase l. Next is the uppercase letters. Obvious, right? After that, we can use digits, then special characters, and finally, all of them together, which combines the lowercase, uppercase, digits, and special characters. Also, you can use some rare types like hex characters and binary as well. Now, let's see an example. What if I want to crack an MD5 hash by assuming that the first position is an uppercase letter followed by seven lowercase letters, then one digit, and finally, a special character. In Hashcat, we need to execute the following command to get the job done. The tag A3 for mask attack, then tag M0 for MD5. After that, we specify the pass to the hashes file. And finally, we add the built-in car sets combination. Look closely at this mask. What if I want to mix up, for example, at the first position, an uppercase with a lowercase character? For this to happen, we need to use the custom car sets type. So let's take an example and see how it works. Again, an MD5 hash, but this time I want to insert an upper or lowercase, followed by seven lowercase letters, then four digits, and finally one digit or special character. In order to get the job done, we need to create two custom car sets. The first one is designated by the tag one, followed by the car set that we want to use. At the end, we create another one, but this one is designated by tag number two. And this is how it looks using Hashcat. Again, we use tag A3 for mask attack, then tag M0 for MD5. Next, we specify the hashes file pass. And after that, I create my two custom car sets and finally, I add the combinations. Take note that I inserted the number one as the first custom group. 
and inserted the number 2 at the end for generating digits and special characters at the same time. Before moving to the next slide, take note that we can create up to 4 custom car sets per mask. The last car set type is the static car set. The best way to describe it is by using an example. Assume we want to hard code the word Elliot, followed by four digits. And in the final position, we want to combine either a digit or a special character. The comment in Hashcat will look like this. This command combines the three types of car sets, not just a static car set. First, the word Elliot is static, right? Then followed by four digits, which are built-in car sets. And finally, a custom car set group, which is designated by the digit or special character. For static car sets, take note that if you want to insert the question mark in your mask, then you have to write double question marks in this case. And here's an example. If you want to use the word who am I, followed by a question mark, then followed by two digits and one single special character. Folks, I have some good news for you. Hashcat offers already some files where they have already filled them up with a huge combination of masks. The pass is under the masks folder in the Hashcat directory. When you want to use the command in Hashcat, all you have is to add at the end the pass to the file in question. Until this day, here are the mask files offered by Hashcat. Take note that each file contains a large number of masks that will allow you to crack passwords like a champ. One final slide. Promise, this is the last one in this lesson. What if you want to crack a foreign language password where it contains some specific set of characters? You can find the list of files in the slash car sets slash special folder. Let's take an example where we want to crack an MD5 Spanish set of characters incrementally from 1 to 10. Here's how it looks like in the command line. Look closely. In this command, we create a custom car set designated by the tag 1. And also, I use the tag I for incremental progression from 1 to 10. And finally, I inserted each custom car set into its proper position. Finally, take note that until this day, Hashcat supports the following languages. French, German, Greek, Italian, Polish, Portuguese, Russian, Slovak, Spanish, and a few more as well. First of all, let me give you a quick peek at the list of masks files that are already built in inside Hashcat. I will be cracking the same hash that we used in the previous demo. But first, I will be using the smaller masks file, which is ROCQ160. If you recall from the previous slides, this file contains 836 masks. And here's the first top 10 that will be executed. Now it's time to run Hashcat. At this stage, I'm assuming that you understand all the options needed to crack the hash 
that we're interested in. I will press enter and pause it because I don't want you to wait for the tool to finish all the masks. I'm back. It took around 10 minutes to run this masks file, but unfortunately it was not able to crack it. So next I will move to a bigger file, which is rock U2 1800. Again, I will pause it until it finishes the execution. This one took around two hours to finish with no luck either. Now, let's go with the third Rockio file and see if it's going to work. Another pause to speed up the process. And I'll be back once it's done. I'm back. And this time it took a few hours to finish. And again, no luck for cracking the hash. At this stage, I'm going to cheat a little bit because I know the mask only exists in the largest file of Rockio. In practice, you don't know the final clear text value, right? That's why I wanted to show you how to proceed from the smaller file first until the largest one. And of course, you stop when the hash is cracked. So I will jump in and execute the largest RockU mask file. To be honest, I have no idea how long this will take, but I will be back once the process has cracked the hash. Folks, it took 16 days to crack the hash. Yes, I'm not making this up. And if I scroll up a little bit, we can see the value of clear text. And here you can also see the mask used to crack this hash. You're probably asking yourself why it took so long to crack this hash. The answer is that Hashcat had to go through 22,823 masks before getting to this mask. Does this mean that the mask attack is terrible? Of course not. Mask attack is very powerful, but you don't start with it. You always leave it until the end, when you're out of choices. I will discuss cracking hashes workflow in detail later in this course. The brute force attack, technically speaking, is trying all the ASCII characters combination from uppercase, lowercase, to digits, and special characters. Now let's see a practical example. Say we want to crack the MD5 hash from one to seven characters. To get the job done, we use tag A3 for mask attack, then tag M0 for MD5, and tag I for incremental to start at the first position until the desired length. And finally, I add the mask for brute force attack with seven characters of length. In practice, we don't use the brute force attack beyond eight characters. Do you want to know why? Let me show you that on my cracking rig. Let's execute the brute force attack only for seven characters in length without the incremental option. So this one will take three hours and a half to finish all the combinations. What if I increase the length to eight? I will stop this one and rerun it with the new condition by adding one lowercase a at the end of my mask. 
This one will take around 14 days and a half to finish all the combinations. Now, what if I want to go beyond 8 characters in lens and try the 9 characters? Same as before, I will be adding one more lowercase a. Check this out. It will take around 3 years and 256 days to finish all the combinations. That's around 4 years. And that's why folks, we don't go beyond 8 characters for brute force attack. Maybe in the future, we'll have faster machines. But in today's reality, that's not practical. The hybrid attack is another type of attack in Hashcat. This attack type will allow you to combine a dictionary file with a mask attack. In this category, we have two types of combinations. The first one is by using the tag A6 and it allows us to append a mask rule to a dictionary file. Amazing, right? And in the second type, we use the tag A7, which allows us to prepend a mask to a dictionary file. Take note that you can use any car set type in the mask part. You can use either a static car set, or custom car set, or built in car set. Also, you can use a mask file, but be careful not to use a large one. Now, let's see a couple of examples using each type of hybrid attack. In the first example, I'm appending a mask attack to the dictionary file rockyou.txt. The mask part uses all the alphanumeric ASCII characters including uppercase, lowercase, digits, and special characters as well. In the second example, I am prepending a mask using the tag A7 that starts with all set of characters first and then five lowercase characters. In this demo, I will be appending a mask to a dictionary file. So I will be using the tag A6 option. Also, I will be cracking the same hash that we did in the previous demos. Next, I will add the incremental option to make sure that I cover all the combinations in the mask attack. After that, I will define my custom mask, which combines digits and special characters. Then I will include the pass to the hash file and not to forget the pass to the Rockyou dictionary file as well. Finally, I append my mask rule, which contains a maximum of five characters and press enter. Check this out. The cracker has already finished quickly. Let's see if we were successful. Indeed, the hash has been cracked successfully. Now it is the time to reveal the secret sauce recipe of all attacks together. At this point, you might be confused and overwhelmed about which attack to choose and where to start if you have a cracking challenge. Should you use a dictionary file, a brute force attack, or a mask attack? The simple answer is to use all of them. 
but you will need to know which one to start with and then take the challenge further step by step. Two variables need to be considered while picking your attack type. First, how long it will take to execute this attack. And second, how people will generate passwords. For example, people in general, remember, when we say the word general here means high probability. They use password that they can memorize based on something they like. Now, let's see how we can use this formula in practice, starting from the quickest attacks to the most timing consuming ones. First, if you can profile your target, a person or a company and generate a dictionary file out of it. For targeting a company, use their website and execute the cool command to get the job done. For targeting a specific person, then you can use cup.py application. And don't forget, to use hashcat dictionary attack using the dictionary file that you just generated using either technique. After that, use a dictionary attack using the rockyou.txt dictionary file. Next, use a dictionary attack using the rockyou.txt dictionary file combined with a rule file. Then try to brute force the first eight characters if you have a powerful cracking rig. And if you don't, then skip the step. After that, use a dictionary attack with a very large word list along with a rule file. Next, use the mask file rockyou160. Then use the combinator attack with the rockyou.txt file combined together. After that, use the combinator attack again with the rockyou.txt file combined with a large word list. And finally, use the largest mask file that you can use in Hashcat if you have a very powerful cracking rig. From here on, it's up to your imagination, but know where to stop. Don't take it personally if you can't crack the hash. Take note that the previous steps are just an example of how you can elevate the complexity. In the end, it's up to you to choose the workflow that suits your need. The most critical component for building a cracking rig is the motherboard. In order to be able to connect multiple graphic cards, you will need multiple PCIe slots. For example, this Gigabyte motherboard has seven PCIe slots and I used six of them. I will show you soon how to use PCIe risers cables to connect the graphic cards to these slots. Remember, the more GPUs needed, then the more PCIe slots needed as well for the motherboard that you want to buy. So, this motherboard that I use for my rig is an X299 gigabyte model that has seven PCIe slots with an armor and double locking brackets for durability. Under the square heat sink, there are two PLX chips specifically built for this motherboard to increase the number of PCIe 
lanes. And this, my friends, will boost the performance of the GPU cards with a dual turbocharge. And finally, Gigabyte added a dedicated power socket for boosting the GPU performance as well. Now for the processor that you need to choose is the one compatible with the motherboard model. In my case, the processor that I've chosen for my rig is the Intel Core i7-9800 series. Always look at the hardware compatibility of your motherboard before you make any purchases. For the disk drive, I've chosen for my rig a 500 gigabyte Western Digital SSD M.2 that can read up to 3430 megabyte per second and write speed up to 2600 megabytes per second. Fox, this SSD will load the operating system or any application like a bus. And we will be using Hashcat to load dictionaries from the disk as well. So it's crucial not to have a slow disk drive while running Hashcat on your workstation. Again, my goal in this project is to get the best quality. Now, quality sometimes doesn't mean expensive because disk drive prices are not that bad these days. Another interesting specification regarding this SSD that it has a black metallic heatsink to allow for best performance. Now, you will learn the reason why I have chosen the graphic cards for my rig. The first reason and the most obvious one is that this card is so fast. Nvidia has re-engineered the GPU's 20 series. That being said, I bought these cards two years ago and now there's even faster ones. This one has 2,304 CUDA cores and a boost clock of 1,620 megahertz. The memory inside this piece of art is 8 gigabyte and a clock speed of 14,000 megahertz. On top of that, the memory inside can handle a bandwidth of 448 gigabytes per second. Finally, it's worth mentioning that the design of this graphic card is made to handle high pressure and temperature. Look closely at the metallic heatsink. These plates along with the fans have been designed for the best cooling solution. Also, it's good to know that in this project, I installed six graphic cards in total. For the PCIe risers, we will need them to connect all the graphic cards to the motherboard. Well, I want you to know about these items. If you want to build your own cracking station, choose high quality risers. I will remind you that all the pieces that were used in this project are available in the resources of this section. Under the pressure of cracking hashes, your workstation can start burning for real in case you get a cheap power supply. In fact, each graphic card can consume up to 175 watts and the six of them will consume around a thousand watt. That's why I've chosen a high quality PSU for my rig that can support up to 1,600 watts. That's not the only reason that I've chosen this specific PSU. If you look closely, this monster support nine VGA cables. Also, we will need three SATA cables for powering the PCIe risers. In fact, I used 
one cable for each two risers. Finally, I needed a power supply that has two plugs for the CPU because the motherboard will need two of these. Again, it depends on the motherboard that you'll have to buy for your rig. For the memory, I installed four of them in my rig, each equivalent to 8 GB. So the total will be 32 GB of memory for this workstation. Maybe you're saying, but that's too much. Maybe that's right. But again, I want my resources to be ready during the hash cracking process. Also, it's good to know that this RAM has an RGB light that will shine all the time, as long as the PC is turned on. That's all you need to know in order to build your own cracking rig. At the stage, you can choose your own components. But remember, always refer to the motherboard hardware compatibility before you make any purchases. And don't forget to check the number of PCIe slots on your motherboard. Also, check that you have enough power to run your rig. Finally, make sure that the power supply will include all the power cables needed for your project. This is it, the end of this course. And I would like to take the opportunity to invite you to check my book of penetration testing to learn more about hash cracking and many more hacking lessons so you can take your career to the next level.